الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولا أن نطلع على أدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more live from the holy city of Karbala. You're joining me, your host, Yahya Seymour, for this regular broadcast live show entitled Back to the Basics. Inshallah ta'ala, I hope I can assume by now that none of the viewers are tuning in for the first time because it is getting long and tedious to have to explain the philosophy of the show every time we tune in. But in short and in summary, this is a show in which we are focusing upon producing a productive methodology for those of us who live in the confusing world that the modern age is. And I say the confusing world because we admit that the modern world is both an era in which guidance is found in abundance and also misguidance is found in an even greater abundance as well. Every Tom, Steve and Harry is given the ability to voice his view, be it religious, social, political, even something along the lines of views on race or gender. Every such person is given their ability to voice their views and they are given a platform to do such. They will also find that that platform attracts other like-minded people but also more importantly, they are able to get their voice to whoever they would like to because we live in the world of the internet. And this has allowed every single person to have a voice. The world of the internet, the world of mass TV broadcasting, which allows us to have this great technology which lets us reach you in the comfort of your homes from the holy city of Karbala. But whilst this amazing technology exists, it is both a blessing and a curse. And of course, the whole purpose of this show is in order to learn together, inshallah ta'ala, how we want to be able to address such concerns. Of course, when I say to learn such, really to dialogue with others is a skill. When I say it's a skill, that is not to say I'm a particularly skilled person at this particular engagement. And indeed, any experience I have or any engagements I have have primarily been quite negative to be honest with you and I would argue that many of us we learn with age <coughs> that there's a certain wisdom in not engaging in cheap polemics in not trying to learn your religion through the concept of debates but nonetheless that does not mean that we are not here to respond to the doubts and the challenges posed to us by others throughout the series we have been looking at the concept of religion as a worldview that is to say, a distinct package of interconnected beliefs which affect the way we view ourselves, the way we view God and the way we view others around us, things such as the way we view knowledge. Essentially, an interconnected series of big questions which, depending on how one answers, you would find there would be drastic consequences. And we've talked about how we compare worldviews against one another. Prior to this brief special which is known as the Christmas special, although today's episode should probably really be called the New Year special, as we are drawing closer to the New Year of the Western Gregorian calendar, we have been engaging with one of the requests made by one of the brothers who had requested myself to give my thoughts on an argument put forward by non-Shia Muslims. This argument is generally put forward by Sunnis, although in reality it could be put forward by anyone, probably with the exception of the Ibabis, who I doubt would be making this argument. The argument goes as thus, that just as the Christians claim to follow Jesus and the Jews would claim to follow Moses, the Muslims en masse believe they are better followers of Jesus and Moses than both the two previous religions which attribute themselves to those prophetic figures. And so the Muslim would generally argue that we believe your religion has number one been abrogated, but number two has gone through a phase of distortion. 
and therefore your attribution to such an individual does not mean you genuinely follow them. However, they come forward and they make the same argument about the key religious, doctrinal and infallible figures of the Shia Muslims. So they would say, for example, that whilst you Shias, you claim to follow the Ahlul Bayt, we dispute this fact. We do not believe you are genuinely followers of the Ahlul Bayt. Rather, we believe that you are claiming to follow the Ahlul Bayt and we believe that we are better followers of the Ahlul Bayt than you are. Of course, the claim was made by someone who I have mentioned in previous episodes of all, out of preference because he's a He's always been very candid with me. We, we could even loosely refer to ourselves as friends. And we've known each other for many years. This individual who I've known, that is very respectful in person. He's older than me as well. I have not wanted to confront him in a way in which people think I am attempting a gladiatorial fight with him. I'm not locking horns with a bull. And I'm not interested in a wrestling match of sorts. Rather, I wanted to put forward what our scholars have had to offer in, in, in addressing the claims made by such an individual. His, the video which was sent to me was known as Schooling the Shias, in which this argument was put forward. Of course, the argument is that we actually follow the Ahlul Bayt properly and the Shias do not follow the Ahlul Bayt. Rather, the Shias follow a group of narrators who are unknown and we don't trust that these narrators accurately reflect what was being taught by the Ahl al-Bayt Of course, it's not just this individual, it's not just the Salafis who put forward this claim. You'll hear this claim very, very commonly from many, many Sunnis, regardless of what their particular religious background is. When I say that, I mean their theological leanings. You'll find Barawis that say it, you'll find Sufis that say it. You'll find very, very pro Ahlul Bayt Sufis claiming that we are the true followers of the Ahlul Bayt. And I remember maybe a couple of years ago now, I was sent a clip in the Arabic language by one of the Yemeni Shafi'i Sufi scholars, very popular in the West amongst those who lean towards Sufism. His name is Habib Ali Jifri. And Habib Ali Jifri had been called out to Sudan, where there had been a wave of conversion to Shiism, and also a wave of conversion to Salafism, what the world generally calls as Wahhabism. In order to combat this spread, particularly the spread of Shiism, he put forward a claim which was that, again, you Shias claim to follow the Ahlul Bayt, I follow the Ahlul Bayt more than you because I have this connected Isnad going back from my father to his father to his father, all the way back to his ancestors, where he talks about how he learnt how to wrap his turban. But of course, our discussion tonight and our discussion with those is not who has an Isnad in turban wrapping. This is not the interest of our subject tonight. Our interest is who legitimately follows the Ahlul Bayt. In responding to the claims made by my friend in the video schooling the Shias. He made the claim that the Shias do not follow the Ahlul Bayt at all. We've already responded to this particular doubt at the theoretical level, where we stated that there are books of Asul al Fiqh, there are books of legal philosophy or the philosophy of law. They specifically stipulate that the Ahlul Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, even if they have an ijma, even if they have a consensus, that is to say, a agreement amongst themselves about a particular opinion, then such an agreement is not a hujja. It is not legally binding as a proof of the correctness or validity of that position, according to the scholars of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So we've shown that when you dismiss the Ahlul Bayt as being people that made mistakes, people that even if they all agreed upon something, we would not follow them then essentially at the theoretical level, before we even enter the practical level, you have excluded yourself from the discussion as to who follows the Ahlul Bayt. Now, of course, the question is, do the Shia actually in theory or practice follow the Ahlul Bayt? We've shown that at the theoretical level, 
The Shias minimally follow the people that they claim are the Ahlul Bayt. So the Shia definition of the Ahlul Bayt will of course be the 14 infallibles. The Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fatima Zahra Alayhi salam, his daughter, and also the 12 Imams, going from Amir al-Mu'maneen Alayhi salam, Amir al-Mu'maneen, Ali ibn Abi Talib Alayhi salatu wasalam, going all the way down to the awaited savior of mankind, al hujj ibn al hasan And these are the figures who we believe are the Ahlul Bayt. So we minimally follow the people that we claim are the Ahlul Bayt. Whether or not the dispute on who is the Ahlul Bayt is going to be resolved tonight, that's a different question. I don't think we should even enter that discussion and that's why we won't. But the question is, Sunnis define Ahlul Bayt in a certain way. They say it's for wives and Ali ibn Abi Talib and Hassan and Hussein and anyone from the family of a prophet generally. And Shias say no, it's just these 14 individuals. Now the question is, do the Sunnis have an evidence that they actually follow the people they claim are the Ahlul Bayt? And we've already shown that this could be problematic because who would you follow in the Battle of Jamal where the wife of a prophet goes out on open war, a declaration of open war and slaughters thousands of her children to fight the legitimate Imam of her time, Imam Ali. Now that's a secondary issue. So when we now come back to the issue of who practically follows the Ahlul Bayt This claim, as I've stated, is not a new claim. It's a very old claim, a very, very old claim. And we find it is one promoted by one of the most renowned figures, critically renowned and accepted as being a mujaddid, a reviver-like figure by those who call themselves the Ahli Hadith, by those that call themselves the Salafis, and by those who follow a more rigid and puritanical version of Sunni Islam. This individual, Ibn Taymiyyah, he states what? I'll quote very quickly and we'll come back to the quote very soon. He states, we do not agree that the Imamiyya take their religion from the Ahlul Bayt, neither the Ishn Ifn Ashariya nor others. Dear viewers, let's take a quick pause here and we'll continue the quote after the break in addition to the implications. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, dear viewers, for enduring patiently with that short break. We were just citing the words of Ibn Taymiyyah, a renowned Sunni scholar, who states the following. We do not agree that the Imamiyyah take their religion from the Ahlul Bayt, neither the Ifn Ashariyah nor others. Rather, they are opponents of Ali and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt in all fundamental beliefs in which they differ with the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and in their Tawheed their beliefs and their belief in Imamah. While it is firmly established that Ali and the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt believed in the Sifat, attributes of Allah and Qadr and in the Khilafah of the three Caliphs, so the three people that came into the historical position of ruling over the early Muslim community after the death of the Prophet and in the superiority of Abu Bakr and Umar and others in all the questions. They contradict the Rafava. That is to say, the Ahlul Bayt, Bayt salam, contradict the Rafava, the Shia. The proofs of this are firmly established in the books of the scholars in that the proofs in this aspect from the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt necessitate certain knowledge that the Rafada are opponents to them and not their followers. This is classical quotes. And it's indicative of the very same claim that was made by our friend in the video in which we saw he happened to be claiming that Shias do not follow the Ahlul Bayt. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah states in the same book the following. Qadr Rafava wa fil fiqh al fuqaha yurja'un alayhi. Namely, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. 
and they were off of a say that in fiqh the jurists refer back to Imam Ali. Wal jawab in have al kibb bayna fal falaysa in have al kibb bayna falaysa fil ammat al arba'a wala ghayrahim min ammat al fuqaha man yarja alayhi fil fiqhihi. This the answer is that this is an obvious lie. So the Shia of Ibn Taymiyyah's time were claiming that the fuqaha refer back to Ali ibn Abi Talib in fiqh, the Sunni fuqaha. Ibn Taymiyyah states this is an obvious lie. Neither of the four Imams, namely Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, or Ahmed bin Hanbal, nor others referred to him in fiqh. As for Malik, he took his knowledge from the people of Medina, and the people of Medina did not take the words of Ali, rather, they took their fiqh from the seven jurists, Zayd, Amr, Ibn Amr, and others like them. So Ibn Taymiyyah admits that they left Ali ibn Abi Talib, the people of Medina left Ali ibn Abi Talib in taking fiqh, and they went with the Zayds and the Amrs and the Bakrs of their time. As for Shafi'i, he took his fiqh primarily from the people of Mecca, the companions of Ibn Juraj, like Sa'id bin Salim al-Qada and Muslim bin Khalid al-Zanji, Meanwhile, Ibn Juraj took from the companions of Ibn Abbas, like Atta and others. Ibn Abbas was an independent mujtahid. When he issued fatwas, he relied upon the statement of Abu Bakr and Amr, and not upon the statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he rejected many things from Ali. Moreover, Shafi took from Malik and then wrote the books of the people and adopted the school of the Ahl al-Hadith and chose it for himself. As for Abu Hanifa, his sheikh from whom he specifically took was Hamad bin Abi Sulaiman, and Hamad took from Ibrahim, who took from al qama who took from Ibn Mas'ud. Abu Hanifa also took from Atta and others. So that's three out of the four not taking from Ali ibn Abi Talib. MashaAllah, they seem to be proud of it, to be honest with you. As for Imam Ahmed, he belonged to the school of the Ahl al-Hadith, the Ahl al-Hadith took from Ibn Uayna, Sufyan ibn Uayna, who took from Amr bin Dinar, who took from Ibn Abbas and Ibn Amr. He, Imam Ahmed, also took from Hisham bin Bashir, who took from the companions of Al-Hasan al-Basri and Ibrahim al nakhai and further took from Abdurrahman bin Mahdi and Waqi' bin al-Jarah and their likes. He sat in the assemblies of a Shafi'i, and also took from Abu Yusuf and chose for himself a word and took from Ishaq bin Rawayh and Abu Ubadah, Abu Ubaidah and others like them. So we see Ibn Taymiyyah admits when it comes to fiqh, <coughs> the four mawahib do not take from Ali ibn Abi Talib. And we saw from the commentary of Ibn Uthaymeen his ta'liqat, his footnotes on Sahih Muslim, that he did not feel it was appropriate to also take from the opinion of Ali ibn Abi Talib in certain places as well. So it's not restricted to just the four classical Sunni schools of thought. Ibn Taymiyyah states there afterwards about tafsir. وَأَيْدًا فَالتَّفْسِيرْ أَخَذَ عَنْ غَيْرْ ibn Abbas أَخَذَ عَنْ ibn Mas'ud وَغَيْرِهِ مِنَ السَّهَابَةِ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يَأْخْذُوا عَنْ عَلِي شَيْئًا Moreover, the tafsir that was not taken from Ibn Abbas was taken from Ibn Mas'ud and others from the Sahaba who did not take things from Ali. There is no known reliable tafsir in the hands of the Muslims, he states. وَمَا يُعْرَفْ بِأَيْدَيِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ تَفْسِيرْ ثَابِتْ عَنْهُ وَهَذِهِ الْكُتُبِ الْحَدِيثِ وَتَفْسِيرِ مَمْلُوءَ بِآثَارِ عَنَ السَّحَابَةِ وَتَابِعِينَ وَالَّذِي فِيهَا عَنْ عَلِي قَلِيلٌ جِدًّا These are the books of hadith and the books of tafsir filled with reports from the Sahaba and the Tabi'een. And what can be found from Ali alayhi salatu wasalam in them is a very tiny minuscule amount. So what we see here is that Ibn Taymiyyah openly admits that when it comes to not only fiqh, but when it comes to the interpretation of the Qur'an, 
the interpretation of the Quran. What comes from Ali ibn Abi Talib is a tiny minuscule amount. Now, why is that relevant to our discussion? Some people might argue, well, Yahya, isn't that a straw man? Isn't that focusing on something that is not the crux of the issue tonight? And I apologize if anyone feels that I am going overboard. Wallahi, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to guide us all and to guide us all to the straight path, inshallah ta'ala. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal before anything to give us all sincerity. But the very point and the very crux which makes many of us even talk about following the Ahlul Bayt is what? It's not the fact that the Ahlul Bayt, we just abstractly felt that because they're from the bloodline of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi, that we should follow them. Absolutely not. Them being from the bloodline of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi is an absolute honor. And it's an honor for them to come from that bloodline. For it is the greatest bloodline. However, that is not why we follow the Ahlul Bayt. The reason we follow the Ahlul Bayt is of course Hadith Al-Thaqalain that states that the Prophet Sallallahu left behind two weighty things, the Book of Allah and the Ahlul Bayt, and that these two things would never separate until they reach him at the lake font. So, when it comes to the Book of Allah, and you have a statement from the Prophet telling you that the Book of Allah and the Ahlul Bayt never separates, and Ali والسلام, is one of those that we agree upon together is from the Ahlul Bayt. What better person would you want to interpret the Qur'an for you? Especially when we find authentic athar from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam in books like Jama Bayan al-Ilm wa Fadlihi and in books like Tafsir al-Tabari in which he says, ask me, ask me about any ayah for Wallah there is not an ayah except that I know upon what it was revealed. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. So we see just from these introductory statements of Ibn Taymiyyah, this grand scholar according to them, not only does he invalidate that his own scholars took from Ali ibn Abi Talib in fiqh, in jurisprudence, and he goes out of his way, by the way, in a very detailed manner to try in detail and chart why none of them took from Ali ibn Abi Talib and demonstrate specifically that they didn't take from him because they were too busy taking from others. But he also demonstrates that they didn't take from him in tafsir either. And he seems to wear this as a badge of honor. Brothers and sisters, I hope throughout this short series of responses, or let's not even call it responses, let's call it reflections upon the initial challenge. We've all come to see which sect does not follow the Ahlul Bayt in any real way, shape or form, at the theoretical level and at the practical level. I thank you so much for bearing patiently with a slight detour from our original course. And inshallah ta'ala tomorrow we shall return to the original discussion, namely the worldview of atheism. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, mm -hmm.